Welcome to Jank Town, and today we're talking about the Wise Mothman. I've been loving this set so far, and the Mothman looks like such a versatile commander that there are really like multiple ways to build this deck. Now, it took me multiple drafts until I found something that like resonated with me. Since you clicked on this video, you probably already know what the commander does, what rad counters do, so I won't read through all of that, but I will walk you guys through commander analysis, the deck's themes, before getting into the individual card choices. Now, as a general rule of thumb, I try not to recommend anything over like $20 or so. That way, we won't end up with the same cards of like Ristic Study, Vamp Tutor, Fierce Guardianship, and all this. If you want to support the channel right now, the only way to do so is by liking and subscribing. I mean, both those things are free. And hey, they really help the channel out. I might have gotten carried away on this one. It's a little bit longer than I expected. Uh, but I really wanted to take you guys through my thought process and how I got to like certain decisions. So buckle up, because this commander analysis might be a bit more reflective than my usual. I know that the Mothman is the face commander of the Precon, but what role does he really fulfill? Now, I think the most satisfying way to play him would be to use him as a build around, meaning he's really gonna be sitting at the center of pretty much everything our deck's trying to do. He's also got one of the unique mechanics featured in the Fallout set, rad counters, so I think it'll be a huge miss if we don't leverage on that. Rad counters, as I'm sure you guys are aware, are kind of like mill counters, right? Opponents at the start of their pre-combat will mill cards and they'll lose a counter whenever a non-land card is milled. So while that non-land clause sounds like it's just a footnote, I think it's something actually worth paying attention to. Say an opponent has about 35 lands in their deck, you know, give or take. That means one rad counter is actually like milling 1.35 cards. Because if they mill a land, they have to mill again on their next turn. Now, I've always enjoyed busting out a mill commander. Fanax was actually one of my earlier brews when I was just starting out. And while Mothman does mill, the rad counters don't really make for a great like mill amount game plan, you know? Our opponents with seven cards in hand and they draw their first essentially start at like 91 cards in their library. So that's like 91 life for mill. And at a rate of like 1.35 cards milled per rad, that means we need to get to something like 60, 60 something rad counters just seems really tough to do. Now I'm not hating on it because I do think giving everyone rad counters is, you know, rad, but it's the second ability of the Mothman that I think is actually pretty powerful and pretty consistent, especially in like non-CDH settings. Whenever a non-land card is milled, we get to distribute X plus one plus one counters to X different creatures where X is the number of non-land cards milled that way. So if you mill a bunch of cards, you're gonna need like a wide enough board to take advantage of that. Otherwise, you're just throwing away plus one plus one counters. And when I thought about that, like honestly, that's when I started to get uneasy because it's like the deck was starting to get unfocused like you know we got a mill but we also need to build up our board and we should probably start looking at our graveyards because I mean we're already milling anyway and we probably want to do something about those counters too like maybe proliferate them or something like that I mean it's not impossible but it is quite a lot of hoops to jump through we'd be like stretching the concept of the deck quite thin and so the fear there is if we don't draw the right mix of cards uh, things just won't go well. And that's when it came to me. Like, you know, having this constraint made me better appreciate the design of the Mothman. Because I realized he's actually introduced a new way, uh, I mean, at least for me, to start looking at Mill. And it's grounded on the pattern of life gain. You know how in life gain there are decks that care about like how much total life you've gained? Kind of like with Veto or Will, like when you use these sanguine bonds, these type of things. And so running cards that gain a bunch of life all at once is more efficient and you know just more beneficial for you. But there are also life gain decks that care about how many times you've gained life, kind of like with Heliod. And so typically those kind of decks are powered by things like Soul Sister, you know, cards like Soul Warden. And so it's kind of similar with Moth. Man, where if we like mill a bunch of cards all at once, say like we mill half of someone's library, right? We'll need a wide board to accommodate all the plus one plus one counters. Like we'll need like 45 different creatures or something. However, if we mill like a soul sister gains life, then we can distribute those counters any way we want. So with a reasonable mill engine like that going, we can then create a consistent way to just start stacking up counters on Mothman or the few other value creatures that we may have without needing to go overly wide. One more thing to keep in mind though is that Mothman only gives counters whenever non-land cards are milled. So 
kind of like what we said earlier that like if a deck is about 35% lands and therefore one red counter is like 1.35 cards milled, the opposite is also true. This means we have like a 65% chance of getting a plus one plus one counter every time we mill. Now even with those odds, I think Mothman is still a house. He can definitely carry as long as he gets to stick around. I mean, one red counter per player around the board might not sound like much, but in one turn cycle, that's still about 2.6 counters generated. And obviously that number goes up the more milling that we do. Now that we have a better understanding of the nuances of our game plan, let's talk about these seven different themes of our deck. So we'll have the essentials of ramp, removal, and draw, but we'll start with talking about mill engines, our graveyard, multipliers, and something we like to call UBP, or utilities, bombs, and pets. Our ideal mill engines are ones that are consistent and triggered separately on the stack. Kind of like Soul Sisters, you know, not one-shot big mill effects. Mesmeric Orb and Memory Erosion mill our opponents for every untapped permanent and for every spell. Now the orb in particular is pretty crazy in this deck because each permanent untapping enters as a separate item on the stack. If they untap 5 lands, you can potentially put like 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters just on the Mothman alone. However, instead of just relying on our opponents, Sphinx's tutelage mills an opponent whenever we draw a card. Now this can be particularly devastating against like one or two color decks because the process repeats whenever those cards share a color. Alter the Brood mills an opponent whenever a permanent enters the battlefield under our control, and Consuming Aberration has opponents mill whenever we cast a spell. Plus he's also a big boy so that kinda helps give us a good board presence. I haven't forgotten about rad counters though, and Nuka Nuke Launcher and Screeching Scorch Beast are a couple of new cards that are repeatable sources of rad counters. Now if you'd notice, a lot of these engine pieces don't come down early, but I mean that's fine, right? You don't have to wait for these before we play out the Mothman, like they're meant to put our deck over the top in terms of value. So the Mothman can come in, do some like milling solo, and it should be able to tide you over in the mid game with one rad counter per opponent. Now with so many cards getting milled, our graveyard is definitely a resource we should use. Direction Reclamation is just a consistent way to like take see back see in case there's a creature that gets milled that we wanted to play. Infesting Rad Roach, a great source of rad and also it recurs itself. And at the top end of our curve is she Yoldred Whispering One. Now the flashiest part about this card is that we get to recur a creature during our upkeep, but don't forget the Swamp Walk. That evasion may come in clutch, especially against black players or if someone's playing like an Urborg, right? Just stack your counters on Shieldred and go to town. Now while these three cards have focused on creatures, I find that bringing in something like Ramunap Excavator is just, you know, responsible. Even if you have a land in hand, sometimes it's better to just crack Evolving Wilds one more time or just fish a land out before our graveyard gets exiled. We also carry cards that care about Mill though in the Master Transcendent, Raul, and Kaga. Now the way these read, it's kind of like Impulse Draw the way, you know, Red has it, but instead of exiling the cards, the milled cards just sort of sit in our graveyard. I also really value how Raul and Kaga allow us access to more than just creatures. I mean, sometimes we might mill our mesmeric orb and at least we can get it back this way. The master is kind of like a reanimate because even though he's restricted only to creatures, at least he can bring them back from anyone's graveyard. Now, last couple cards are Unnatural Restoration. I mean, you could go with Eternal Witness in the slot. It also makes sense since she's a creature that we could put counters on, but I value the proliferate here. Also, Rise of the Witch King. It's a card that I think provides a lot of value. The Edict is just some kind of like good incidental removal, but I like how we can target any permanent in our graveyard and then bring it back. The Mothman is the core of our game plan with its rad counters, plus one plus one counters, but multipliers are ways that we can just snowball into value. Hardened Scales, Winding Constructor, and Corpse Jack Menace are all ways to put more plus one plus one counters on our creatures, making our commander's second ability all that much more hardworking. But there's also value in proliferating effects with Flux Channeler, Evolution Sage, and Agent Frank Corrigan all being repeatable sources of proliferation. Vexing Radgal and Thurmingbird are a pair of flyers that can proliferate, although they do need to connect in combat. Now, last on this list are a pair of one-time effects. Radstorm got a lot of hype, rightfully so. It's a splashy card for sure, but I also like Ripples of Potential. I mean, it's just proliferate, but it has the upside of saving our board against the white. Next up is Ramp, and I'm actually not bringing the Arcane Signet this time around, although I am still packing a Soul Ring. I mean, if you want to dip your toes in the jank, you could replace this with something like Replicating Ring. Uh, it's not as good, it's also slower, but it just seems so much more fun, especially with all our like, proliferate shenanigans, you know? But since this is a deck tech primer, you know, I feel obligated to tell you that 
Soul Rain has just worked so much better in terms of accelerating our game plan, which Ramp is pretty much supposed to do. Now, because we're in green, three visits, Nature's Lore and Farseek are staples because Land Ramp is just so much more reliable than Artifact Ramp. And I also like Entish Restoration. It's just a means to instant speed ramp while also getting a land in our graveyard, which we can potentially recur. Potato Farmer, just another means of Land Ramp, allowing us to essentially play one more land on top of the usual one per turn. And Kodama from the West Side. Now, it ramps us for every creature with a plus one plus one counter on it that gets through. And it also gives our team trample so that they don't just get chunked. Now, outside of land ramp, we are bringing Huron Blade Elite, Gyre Sage, and Kami of Whispered Hopes as some of the hardest working mana dorks around. The Kami synergizes like crazy with Mothman's ability. If you play him on turn 3, get Mothman down on turn 4. By the time the turn cycle comes back to us, if we mill like 3 non-land cards from Rad, we could be looking at like a 7 power Kami just because of that whole add an additional counter effect. We've essentially jumped from turn 5 to turn 12. Now that is ramp. Last Last in our ramp package is as foretold. Now we have proliferate effects, so this thing can get going rather quickly. But even at just a few counters, getting a free like nature's lore is pretty good. Now because we're such a proactive deck, our removal is mainly focused on wipes if we need to stabilize and reset. Vats is a new card that can't be responded to, and it can kill multiple creatures at once. Nuclear Fallout gets around things like Indestructible while also giving out some rad counters. And Wave Goodbye is kind of like a ghetto Cyclonic Rift for the deck, but it can be used to clear out blockers and we can use it to go in for the kill. Some targeted removal though is Assassin's Trophy, just one of the best removal cards in the game, and Canker Bloom, which can get rid of a pesky artifact or enchantment, but it's also something that we can cash in to proliferate at instant speed. Now, as good as it is to fill up our graveyard, drawing cards the old-fashioned way is pretty hard to beat. Tezzeret's Gambit, Experimental Augur, just lets us see more cards and they've got proliferate tacked onto them so you know that's nice but the more consistent ways to draw cards is through something like guardian project which comes with a pre-con awesome reprint thank you wizards and also what i think is the best draw enchantment since rustic study the struggle for project purity i mean yeah there's a mode that talks about rad counter something like this but this card lets us draw an extra three per turn are you kidding me I don't know, man. I gotta try this card out. We also wanna take advantage of all the counters we're creating. So Marler Queen takes advantage of rad counters, while Fathom Mage and Danny Pink take advantage of our plus one plus one counters. Now don't get fooled by Danny Pink's for the first time each turn clause. It's not as restrictive as you think. Each creature we control gets that ability, meaning if we distribute like three plus one plus one counters, we get to draw three cards. For burst draw, we're bringing in Contaminated Drink, which also gives radiation. Return of the Wild Speaker, just a classic burst draw in green. And Inspiring Call, which doubles up as like board wipe protection. UVP time. Now, obviously this deck loves getting its value, but to help us close out the game, Blood Chief Ascension is a finisher in this deck. Having just like two rad counters per opponent can already unlock it in just like one turn cycle. Now for combat, Okima and Nightkin Ambusher can both be unblockable, while Herald of Secrets streams and champion of Lambholt can give our entire team unblockable. I mean, particularly if we keep growing the champion. I also decided to put the other rad counter creatures here, like Bloatfly Swarm, Feral Ghoul, Glowing One. Not the biggest fan of these cards, but I mean, we are playing the Mothman, we're already playing with rad counters, so I mean, might as well. I did cut strong the Brutish Thespian though, because I mean, like, at 6 mana value, no evasion, I don't know, he just costs too much. I do really like Vault 12 though, I mean, it gives radiation, also creates zombies based on the total rad counters on players. So let's just go wide every now and then, just a nice change of pace in terms of our play pattern. Finally, Archdruid's Charm. I mean, what can't this card do, right? It's a tutor, it's ramp, it's removal for creatures, artifacts, enchantments. I mean, it's only eight bucks right now, and if you don't have a copy yet, I think you should pick one up, because this one definitely punches above its price point. Before we wrap up, I just want to highlight the 101sts, aka three card set, didn't make the cut, but almost did. And the first is Simic Ascendancy. Ultimately, I felt like this would make our play pattern too linear. Like, I'm fairly confident that we can get to 20 counters with some pretty good consistency. So, you know, I just didn't want to have that crutch. Next one is Mind Crank. Now, this is a two-card combo with Blood Chief Ascension. And I don't know, I'm just not a fan of two-card combos in general. I want to <laughs> work a little bit harder. I don't know if that's just so hipster of me. But if I had to choose between the two pieces, I think the Ascension is just a more interesting card. Last on the list is Vraska Betrayal Sting. She's a walker that proliferates, which I think goes really well with our deck. Uh, and with all our proliferate effects, I think it's definitely possible to get her to ultimate. And so while I did make a conscious effort to stay away from things like Infect, 
toxic poison, things like this. I was very close to giving her the exception because it's like, I mean, she's a nuclear bomb and you know, it's fallout. She got cut in my build, but ultimately it's up to you if you want to run her. And that's it for this episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that video. I know I had a lot of fun brewing around the Mothman. If you found it useful, I hope you could leave a like, share, and subscribe. Those things really help the channel out. On that note, I can't believe we're actually almost at like a thousand subscribers. <laughs> pretty crazy. Man, I remember making my first video and I was just at like three subscribers. Pretty much the people that I played with that day, you know? <laughs> but yeah, like, I mean, I'm appreciative of like the support that uh, many of you have shown. I mean, I read the comments, man. I read all of them. So when I read that like I was able to help somebody or like give people ideas on, on a commander maybe that they're interested in, uh, it's really fulfilling. In any case, I hope to make more content for you guys in the future. Uh, stay inspired friends and I'll see you soon.